not. So with any way, we will move on to our, our speaker uh, of the month, our uh, of, uh, here from Canada, Michael McAdam. Well, hello. How's everybody today? Happy to see you. Oh, happy to be here. Uh, like, I really enjoy this. And, you know, full disclosure for your listeners, um, I'm not actually an artist. Uh, I'm a writer uh, and I publish and I do almost everything to do with making comics except the actual drawing part. I kind of have to outsource that. So, uh, well, that's me. <laughs> how, how you work with artists and how you're part of publishing and you're how do and you're making this happen. So, it all works together. It does. It does indeed. Um, I've learned so much about collaboration um, and about how to ha share is the better word. I think share your vision with the person you're working with because they are not your slave. You're not their slave. You both are on a journey and you've got to meet on that journey and you've got to walk it together. So um, I, I, over the years have been learning a lot about that. <laughs> But uh, a little bit about me. My name is Michael McAdam, as we said. Uh, I am the head honcho of Two Gargoyles Comics, um, which is uh, basically me and another person. And the, the other person keeps switching in and out as I work on different projects with them. But always Two Gargoyles. And uh, I, uh, I write, I letter, um, and I publish. And then I, as I said, outsource my art all over the world actually. And so I have brought some things to share today. Um, and I'm just going to hit the share screen button here. And we'll see how this goes. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, boop. Oh, and that would be my Facebook, which is not what I want. Boop. There we go. And what I'm going to do is hide that. Doo, there we go. And let's dive right in. Okay, so here is a brief overview of my comics. Can you all see this? Yep. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, I'm mm. always adding more because I can't, I basically, artistically speaking, I can't shut up. <laughs> I can't stop creating. Um, so uh, I do have to watch out though. Like I, I do finish projects. I don't just start 20 of them and then abandon them. No, I'll start 20 and I will finish 20. Absolutely. So we have Xanthus, which is uh, my latest uh, comic there up in the top left, The Light of Joy. You fight the forces of darkness and despair with the light of Xanthus. Uh, the middle comic, Twilight Detective Agency Girls Out, is actually the only comic put out by Two Gargoyles that I didn't write. It's uh, all done by my good friend Mike Rieger. He does the, the writing, the scripting, the art, the everything. Uh, Thunder is my Canadian superhero because I wanted to tell a story about a superhero from Canada, not from New York or Los Angeles. Gloaming is my horror comic, uh, which is about a small town that is uh, in the middle of nowhere. And you can't really tell where it's where it is. And you can't leave once you get there until you figure out why you're there. Spectrum is my LGBTQ focused comic that I use superheroes to talk about the idea of coming out and realizing identity and that sort of thing. Um, but it's it's much more about the people than it is about the superpowers. But because I love superpowers, I had to throw it in there. The Magical Mr. Punch is a, a young British mage uh, who is fighting to keep the balance between the forces of order and chaos. And he's cheeky and he wears a top hat. Twilight Detective agency is about two gargoyles that run a detective agency but nobody knows they're not human and the daring delightful diaper man is me making fun of comics everything in that comic is a parody of something or someone uh, just to show how ridiculous it all is so thrills chills giggles and laughs it's all on twogargs.com <laughs> and you had another one right in the middle at the top which one's that one? Oh, the uh, girls out twilight detective agency girls out uh, that's the one that is not written by me. Uh, it's written by Mike uh, Rieger. And it is a spinoff of Twilight Detective Agency, but starring two female gargoyles. And it's a bit of a, a statement. Um, Mike wanted to try an experiment where unless there was a story reason for a character to be male, he made them female. 
because he wanted to tell a story that was the antithesis of the trend in a lot of comics, you know, where it's like male centric or male focused. So uh, he is trying to tell a story uh, that features primarily women and, and monster women. <laughs> I have to say that Gargirls is a wonderfully terrible pun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gargirls. <laughs> well, they are. <laughs> yeah, so I um, I diversify when I create because that's just sort of my process. Um, if I get bored working on one project, I just, you know, sidestep to the other project. And they both move forward. Um, but sometimes at different paces, uh, because I will keep working, but not always on the same thing. Um, and uh, that that's how I sort of keep my production levels up, I guess, would be the way to put that. Uh, let's see. Boop, boop. Oh, my latest comic here. Let's see. Where is he now? There he is. Whee! Xanthus um, is basically me studying the idea of fighting depression. And yes, once hmm. again, because I just can't get off this topic, I do use superheroes as my, my metaphor for this. But in this instance, instead of, you know, Biff, Bam, Sock, Pow, uh, fighting supervillains, he's literally fighting the darkness in all of us. It's a study of mental health. It's a study of overcoming uh, mental adversity. And uh, also I... I really just like yellow. So I, I wanted to equate yellow with joy. And so that's what I've done. Let's see here. Doot. Um, it's It starts in outer space. Um, we have, uh, we introduce Xanthus, who is an energy being. Um, he, it, I should say, I shouldn't say he, uh, it comes to earth um, and rescues uh, uh, sees the depression on the earth and finds that there's a young man, Sean Preston, who is about to take his own life. And so he rescues him, fuses with him, merges his energy with him, and that creates the hero persona. And Xanthus, of course, being the living energy embodiment of joy, is able to project joy into other people temporarily so that they can remember the good times and thus fight depression. I'm probably oversimplifying that. It sounds so much deeper in my head. <laughs> but that just came out. I just had a successful Kickstarter with that. Um, and uh, I was very, very pleased to see that there was interest in it because you never know, right? When you create, and I actually just wrote about this on my sub stack, like who do you create for? And the only honest answer I can give is that I create for me, right? If I feel that if the work is honest, if you're creating for you, your audience will find you. If you follow your own path, you are eventually going to attract like-minded people. Um, uh, one of my influences is actually Donna. Um, her Desert Pete and Stintz, her approach to comics, her approach to storytelling was so different from any of the other stuff that I'd been exposed to prior. I found it inspirational. Um, I love different storytelling. I love uniqueness. And I would, I would characterize Donna's work as unapologetic because it's real. It's honest. It's her. Um, and so... I strive to be the same way when I'm creating, even when I'm creating in perhaps a more familiar milieu, like with superheroes, for example. But uh, no, Donna uh, is absolutely one of my one of my mentors in uh, creating. So it's uh, really really cool to be here <laughs> and be and be talking, uh, you know, in in this group. I have a question. Yes. Um, pragmatic question. How much uh, did you shoot for with your Kickstarter? I have, uh, over time, I've, I've run the gamut, you know, because I, it's always a test. It's always a, a like, what will, what will work? I have shot for $3,000 before, um, Canadian dollars. Um, and, uh, and I've succeeded 
but uh, you know, like I had to call in the big guns, by which I mean family, uh, <laughs> to help boost me over the edge. So this time I set it for just a thousand because I found that statistically over the course of the last four or five Kickstarters I've done, I have been able to raise a thousand on my own. And I was successful this time. So this is actually my first comic that is completely funded by uh, interested readers and not necessarily family. So that, that was kind of a big plus for me. But uh, yeah, so uh, the guys that run, uh, let's see, it's Dave Kellett and Brad Geiger. They do a podcast called uh, Comic Lab. And yeah. their big their big saying is, first comes the crowd, then comes the funding. And I've always found that to be a catch-22, you know, because you can't draw a crowd unless you create something. And if you can't create because you're waiting for funding, then you're kind of stuck in a loop there. But what I learned from that is you yourself have got to have skin in the game. So yeah, I'm going to put my own money into my own creations to get them out there and start the ball rolling. Overnight success takes 10 years, they say. Well, I'm still waiting and it's been since 1996, but I am finding that the success is coming. And I would say to anyone listening to this, you must never quit. Or rather, if you do quit, you must start up again at least one more time uh, than, than you've quit. So quit 99 times, but start up again 100 times. Never give in. Keep going. Keep creating. Keep moving forward. That's what I say about that. And speaking of proselytizing, uh, I uh, or proselytizing, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know if you've ever heard of Chick Tracts. Yeah. Um, which are those little religious tracks that people leave at bus stops and whatnot. Uh, they were made famous by Jack T. Chick, who was an evangelist, um, you know, and he would do the most crazy thing. <laughs> thumbs down, thumbs down. He would do the most crazy things, um, right? And I actually loved these comics because they were so unapologetically subversive, you know, and a little mad to boot, but I always found myself reading them. So I decided, hey, if the churchy people can do it, why can't I do it about indie comics? So I created uh, a bunch of my own little chick tracks. Um, this one's called The Indie Conspiracy. And it's all about the evils of the indie creatives who are sucking the life out of the corporate masters of uh, large corporations, you know. Um, and hang on a second while I... And boop, there we go. There's a conspiracy afoot that you probably don't even know about. And, you know, because they always start that way. They, the Chick Tracks always draw you in with some inane or insane uh, proposition. There are people writing and creating their own comic books, peddling them to unsuspecting readers. And you won't usually find them in stores, but if you go to your local comics shop, you may find them in a secret coded section labeled with the words local creators. These are independent comics called indie in hushed tones by the conspirators. So the whole setup, the whole joke to me doing this is to make it seem like it's this horrible thing that's taking over the world. And then, of course, leading the audience down the garden path until you finally realize, no, this is awesome and it's fun and it's it's your salvation is at hand. Um, and uh, that I love doing them. I love handing them out at conventions. People actually have stopped by my table asking if I have new chip tracks. <laughs> so I, I'm going to, I don't know how to gather them all together in one sort of compilation, but uh, um, I, anytime anyone orders a comic from me, there's usually a chip track that I throw in with them. So they get this little extra bonus. And it's a fun little read. And, you know, hey, if you're done with it and you don't want it anymore, Leave it out on the bus, leave it on a plane, leave it, you know, anywhere um, for someone else to pick up because why not be subversive, right? It's a way of promoting ourselves and advertising without really looking like advertising, really. And it was just one of the many ideas that I, I looked into and thought, you know what, that, that, I love the idea of using comics to promote comics. 
I just think that works very well. So let's see here. What have I got? Another thing I do to promote my comics, I don't know if you guys remember, in the 60s and 70s, Hostess fruit pies were a huge cultural thing in the back of comic books. Um, there was always a popular character who was defeating a villain with hostess fruit pies or or uh, cupcakes or Twinkies or whatnot. So I did. Um, oh, hang on a second. There we go. Um, in the back of uh, many of my comics, I have done uh my own i call them mostest desserts and it's always a little story with some of the characters from my comics and the treasure it's beautiful so much gold delicious golden sponge cake you mean oh yeah with creamy filling yum it's a package of pleasure with golden treasure in mostest twinks cakes and so it's like a shameless shameless parody uh, of the the popular ads and i find that people really respond to them you get the nostalgia people who remember the comics from way back when and you get the new audience that are like this is ridiculous what is this and they find it enjoyable um so i I've, I've had fun doing that too which is another promotional way to create your own niche create your own um personality if you will uh cuz if you've you know ever worked a convention, you know that you're fighting for bandwidth. You're fighting for to be noticed. You know amidst a sea of amazing art and comics and 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 whatnot. How do you get noticed? How do you have people show up at your table, right? And having something that is your personality and that people can get used to and keep coming back for, I have found builds my audience. They they like the the personality of what I do, if that makes any sense. Oh, could I ask who your artist is? I love the line work and the coloration uh, oh. they do. Oh. So maybe say who your artist is. Oh yes, yes, thank you. Like, see, writer. Like, oh yeah, the artist. Uh, sorry about that, you guys. Um, Miguel Puerta. Semi semi official meeting guide here. Yeah. <laughs> Miguel Puerta is the artist uh, for Twilight Detective Agency um, and for this particular uh, mostest ad. And he has such a, it feels vintage to me, his style. It mm -hmm. feels like old pulp, you know, and I'm, and because Twilight Detective Agency is detective noir, I was like, you, you are made to do this comic. I mean, this is fantastic. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I'm very pleased. I will call up uh, some of the pages from that comic. Pardon me for a second. Doo -doo -doo. Documents. TDA. T -T -D -A. There we go. So one of the recent issues here. Like I do the comic in black and white um, with colored narration just to Ooh. so the eye could read that. And his, his tones, his grays, his pencils, they just really suit the feeling of, of, of the book, I think. Let me see. Uh, find one that's a little more modern here. I'm, because this is a big flashback issue. There we go. Dun, dun, dun. At the hands of the villain. We have our characters here. So we have Hawkstone, who is the, the bigger gargoyle on the left, and then Riverdale, who is the uh, smaller gargoyle uh, here on the, the second panel in. And there we go. So his cross hatching, his his shading here, um, I, it's just, and his lines feel have that sort of big and blocky feel that to me is very almost like Dick Tracy ish, you know. Uh, it, it makes me feel like I'm looking at the '40s, even though it's set in modern times. Yeah, Miguel is from Mexico. Um, I mm -hmm. 
I found him as I find most of my artists actually on Facebook. Um, mm. There's a group called Connecting Comic Book Writers with Artists, which is the perfect definition of what it is I'm looking for. So I usually put up a little ad there saying, I am looking for someone for this style of comic, blah, blah, blah. And uh, people send me their portfolios. And I go, okay, who seems to fit the most with blah, blah, blah. And away we go from there. Mm. And I've had amazing success finding really good people. So I recommend that to anyone um, who's in my position of looking for an artist is Facebook is a great resource. Tumblr is great too, but I find that a lot of the Tumblr artists are pinup artists, not so much with oh, the sequential. Yeah. Yes. What's your pay rate? Uh, it depends on the artist. Like my budget is anywhere from 80 to 120 a page, depending on, on the art and whatnot. Uh, and that's us funds. Um, I usually, we usually discuss budget and, you know, what's sustainable and what's, and what's not. And some people, some people lowball me and I'm like, no, no, you're worth more than that. Let's bring mm -hmm. it up a little bit because it, it's actually a personal annoyance to me when people try to lowball artists or when they try to mm -hmm. get something off an artist you know by negging them or by saying oh well i my budget's only 20 dollars a page i'm like well then you can't afford to do a comic no. exactly. and this is just the reality it's like mm -hmm. I mean, if someone said to me, my rate is $300 a page, I would say, thank you very much for your time. Unfortunately, that's not in my budget. But I would never try to get them to lower their rate. Like, And I, I will say this to artists right now, because a lot of the people I work with have horrible self-esteem. I'm like, you need to charge what you're worth. I mean, And you are worth more than you think. Oh, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, at the very least, when you think of it as in per hour minimum wage oh gosh yeah with, uh, yeah i mean a fully inked page i can do not counting the blocking out and and uh inking the blocking out and planning part of it averages about uh uh five hours if i'm really but at the same time you want to you don't want to rush it that much so so based on that a minimum of a hundred <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, what's what's minimum wage in Washington? Fifteen dollars. OK, so if you had like six hours, ninety dollars is minimum wage. Yeah. So a mm -hmm. hundred bucks is not that much more. And I believe people need to really start understanding that they really mm -hmm. do, you know, because um, like to me, art is magic. I don't know how to do it. Other people do. But I want to pay for that service. And yes, I'm not up there in the big leagues, you know, with my $300 a page budget or whatever, but I don't expect people to come down from what they need to live. Do you know what I mean? Because it should be sustainable. It should be livable. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I have this little anecdote of, of, of one time doing a gig for a guy in a bar, uh, and rule the other lesson is not to do get arrangements from a bar but uh but it was sort of like for a piece of christ bad christian art for 50 dollars, and and along with it being an unpleasant assignment as each hour went by the value of my work felt like it was going down the drain <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and that uh, i find that and i'm not even the artist in this case, but I find that debilitating because you can only deal with that onslaught of, of, of negativity, like so long before you, you start to feel like crap. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes it harder for you to get up the next day and be like, no, I'm going to keep creating. I'm going to keep working, you know, while other people are trying to devalue you, you know, and it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I have a friend that yelled at me uh, because I was doing comics and not building in a writing cost to them. Like I wasn't paying myself anything. And uh, she's like, if you're going to do a Kickstarter, maybe pay yourself. And I'm like, 
oh, it literally hadn't occurred to me. And I've been doing this since 1996. Oh, she tore a strip off me. Um, and therefore, it, it, I, I realized how easy it can be to forget your own needs when you're in this weird and wild and wonderful world, you know. But so I, I, I reiterate again, please, please value yourself and charge what you're worth. 100%. So I worked for I worked for Marvel Comics and we had one day turnaround. I was just an inker. And so I started out at $90 a page and then ended up at $110 a page. For a so one day turnaround? As a yeah, one day turnaround as an anchor. Wow. And how many hours would that be? With I know a one day turnaround is for a single <laughs> page? Single page, yeah. It yeah. would depend on, you know, the complexity of the thing I was doing. You know, big crowd scene with the X-Men. And... Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, eight to ten hours, maybe. Yeah. Wow. So crowd scenes are... I mean, I don't know. I don't want to know how how long it would take to do some of those crowd pages that uh, Phil Jimenez and uh, and uh, George uh, George Perez are famous for. <laughs> right. There's a popular yeah, meme Jeff actually, Garrett. where the writer says, "Oh no, you could do so much in a comic. It's just so much easier than animation." So I've written this twenty person crowd scene, and the artist leaps across the table at him, going, "I'll kill you! I'll kill you, you son of a bitch!" <laughs> I, I mean, twenty person piece of cake. That's yeah. nothing. Civil War, that's something. <laughs> right? Gosh. Christ. And remember, there's a rule in comics. And you've seen it work too often. You're not allowed to draw a good horse. You know, it. you taught me that. And now <laughs> I cannot see a horse in comics without taking a really good look at it and going, no, no, that's not a good horse. No. <laughs> now, now I, have, I have an exception. I have yes. an exception. If you draw it in your style. Stephen Notley, you Jimbo, um, uh, anybody, if they draw it in their style, if it's just part of their comedy, they can draw it any way they like it. It works. Yes. But if you're going to be doing realistic wagons, people, scenery, damn it, at least look at a YouTube of a horse. Right. At least <laughs> one. See, I find that interesting, right? It's not like a horse is an exotic, strange animal, you know? Like, there's reference. References, people. Like, why are we afraid of references? But ever since you told well, me that... It's, um, just remember, they are considered among um, people who do study animals to be one of the bizarre beasts. Oh, I did not know that. They're, they're built off. Yeah, those back they run on their toenails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. they're they're just very strange. Their mouth and their nose does not connect. <laughs> things like that. But yeah. no, um, it just seems almost to be a law in comics that thou shalt not draw a horse correctly. And I'm not asking for Sam Savage or Paul Brown. It's just a horse has a butt and their tail doesn't come out of their anus. <laughs> 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 and I, their elbows aren't there. Oh, wow. Well, I, 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 I freely admit that I can barely even trace a horse and I don't make those mistakes. <laughs> like I said, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Jake remember, Mobius well, you, uh, Dale, Dale just made a note about Stephen Notley and the horse I gave over on Patreon. I was giving little classes, uh, challenges is what they were. One yes. of the challenges was cars. I did a terrible job because I don't draw cars well, but I was trying very hard to learn. And Stephen came on and he drew this stupid horse with human feet and hooves and everything. <laughs> and I said, I dare you to put that in Bob the Angry Flower. So he did. <laughs> and this is the All other right. thing. Never mess with a cartoonist. Um, right? No, no. Give them a wild idea, they'll do it. You insult them while well, you're the next enemy. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, right down to what clothes you wear. So, I'll just know, say Jeff, Jeff, Darrow, Jeff Darrow's horses and Mobius horses on the Blueberry series. Good uh, well, stuff. the one that gets it right, uh, even though they're highly cartoon, 
is um, Asterix. Oh, all right. They're very good, even though they're very like a cartoon. Yeah, their heads are too big. They have little skinny legs. But every joint, every bone, <laughs> every proportion is correct. That's they're very good horses. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. It sounds crazy. Good. You look at Asterix as horses, and you're going, "What?" But they're correct. It's just you know what they are. They're homunculus horses. Yes. You remember what a homunculus is? Yeah. Yeah. The drawing little, that yeah. shows the body. You know, the head is biggest. The hands are big. What what is most important to your body is drawn on the figure. You know what that is. Yes. Okay. Well, I basically consider them humonculus horses. <laughs> because other other than the wild stretch and squash, they're extremely accurate. I want to talk about uh the, the power of the cartoonist because uh Donna, for a while there, you were going through a phase of being an art witch because everything you drew happened that's why i started trying to draw happy things yeah <laughs> because uh, see you know, we I talk like about buffy the vampire slayer you know right well we, we talk about artists as interpreting the world around them right but how interesting that for you you seem to tap into something where the world began to interpret you and well, I if I, find if that I drew it and if it was published, if it became public, then yeah. it would happen. And so it was <sighs> like, maybe I better stop drawing this stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> you I did, did my best. It you did a book really called uh, Little Deaths, right? Was that what it, the title was? Well, A Little Death is is something completely different. That's, um, do you remember uh, Kevin Bowes? If you don't mind me talking about another artist at this point, Kevin Bowes did A Little Death. Uh, um, what was it a little deaf uh no the virgin project the virgin project that's what he did okay yes. and wonderful wonderful stories um sweet stories terrifying stories painful lovely everything about people losing their virginity yes. and he was he says you have to do one i says no 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 you've already done it you're doing virginity i mean that's what do i do and uh somebody suggested donna you can do death and i went that's fiction nobody's died yet that can talk about it or write about it. And I will not allow a Ouija board in the house. Yeah. Yes, I'm a scientific Christian, but I or scientific atheist, but I will not allow a Ouija board in the house. Anyway, but he said, you have to do death. And I says, I can't do that. It's fictional. He says, well, okay. So he runs off and he takes one of his questionnaire sheets, but he makes it for death instead of virginity. And uh -huh. he brings me back a stack. So I had to do the project. I didn't, I had to do a little death. Because he'd gone to all that effort. He basically went and got everybody's stories. But what you had to do for that was you switched st uh, the story with the physical drawing description of a I different person. I switched everything. And then I, I lost the records. I don't know what their gender or sex is. I don't know their age. I don't know what they did for a living. I don't know anything about them. I just made the story that they wanted. And then I drew it any which way. And then I completely lost the records. So I cannot connect any of those stories to the original pages that he had. And thus saving people from the art witchiness. Uh, well, the which problem you were was <laughs> some people had lovely stories about how they would wanted to die or yes. thought they would die. But a yes. lot of people had very bad ones. Yes. Like the person that says, I want to die screaming. And it was like, so I showed the cops finding a dead body outside of las vegas it's like be careful what you ask for her. yeah right and you but don't want that to come I didn't true connect either that to her so if you have <laughs> yeah and i just bought some copies of little death so if anybody wants to pick them up on uh, amazon or at me it shows and things anyway but this is about your art. oh well lovely um but i still I, I again like the whole idea of art having power and respecting artists it, bringing it full circle there it's like yes value yourself um so speaking of horrible death uh, I have uh, one of my first graphic Ooh. novels, the the town of Gloaming. Uh, so Gloaming is my horror novel about a small town, and I have completed four issues of it and gathered them into a graphic novel. And this is my first one. Uh, I had put out a Thunder graphic novel about ten years ago, but it was with another artist, and I rushed it 
and it was not my best mm. work. So I, I retired it. And the funny thing is, my personal philosophy is, no, don't go back and redo. Do better going forward. But in this case, I was like, no, because you're not putting your best foot forward. And if you want to gather an audience, you've got to do that. So I redid the first uh, four issues of Thunder. But Gloaming is the one that was completed first and came out as a graphic novel. And uh, it's been, I, I had a really successful Kickstarter for it. And uh, people, I it has fans. It has people coming back going, where's more Gloaming? And I'm like, I'm, I'm one person. <laughs> it's like, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> but uh, Gloaming is about this. Uh, the fellow on the right there is Doug Carter. He's a journalist. He comes to the town of Gloaming looking for this famous child rock star that he's written a book about. And he's like, as a rock journalist, he's followed this kid's career for, you know, a couple of years. And then somebody told him, what are you talking about? There's no such kid. So he comes to Gloaming to prove the kid's existence. And that's page one. And it gets weirder from there, as you can see, by the United States Marine Corps werewolf, who is <laughs> looming over him on the cover. <laughs> this art is done by Kyle Burles, who is local here to Calgary. He's a friend of mine. Um, he and I, uh, ironically, were in Orlando uh, going to Disney, and there was an abandoned hotel next to our hotel so we spent an afternoon there taking pictures and then looking at everything and from that we came up with the idea of a pretty creepy small town and mm. we went on from there let's see y'all do i have any gloaming pages do 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 I didn't know how much we'd be covering today, so I, I didn't, uh, you know, skew up every single thing ever. Um, that well, I've it's uh, we we normally do this for an hour because it's Saturday. People do have other things, and also public speaking is strenuous, so we kind of set it at an hour. So whatever fits yeah. into that hour. Oh, lovely! All right, so let's see here. Boo -boo, boo -boo. All right, so we have. Carter and Baxter is the United States Marine. Um, and he is the one that is basically narrating to Carter how the town's magic works, but he's very dodgy and cagey about it. Um, telling Carter he's going to have to learn for himself. Um, and so, of course, Carter, like there's a lot of uh, scenes. Oh, there's me. That's my cameo, having my coffee knocked out of my hand. There we go. <laughs> um, so Carter has to uh, figure things out as he goes because the the secret to gloaming is you can't leave until you figure out why you're really there. Mm -hmm. So it's got a little bit of House of Mystery. It's got a little bit of those, you know, Tales from the Crypt Keeper kind of vibe to it. And although the first four issues are one story arc, from issue five on, I'm going to begin doing smaller stories uh, as Carter begins to investigate Gloaming and uncovers mm -hmm. all these little stories. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm writing that right now for Kyle. Do ready, and then of course I couldn't leave my boy alone here so here he is thunder who is my vancouver dwelling half norse god half canadian super polite character um and uh because i really wanted to to tell a canadian story and here he is in his jammies <laughs> because i i don't do superhero stories like the old four color ones i like to write people um, people come first because that's what's relatable. Who is this person? What is their motivation? What is their life? You know, what can we as readers participate in? And this art is done by Mark and Marvin Marvita. Uh, Mark does the line work. Mar uh, Marvin does the colors. I've been working with them for, oh, about eight years now, I'd say. And uh, they always deliver. I mean, they're they're just a fantastic pair. Uh, really enjoy them. 
And then we have a whoop, a dog because you have to have a dog. Um, his his he's a Chow Chow, and his name is Chairman Mao, which I don't know if I'll get in trouble for, but I guess we'll find out. Uh, let's see here. Oh, blah 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 blah. I I came up with Thunder as having a Norse background, and I put out my first issue just as the Marvel Thor movie came out. And I was so upset because I don't know if you guys have ever run into this, the, the, the parallel development where you have this great idea and you just put it out and then something bigger and louder has the same idea. And so you end up looking like you copied. <laughs> it's it's it, I find it endemic to the creative sphere right um there's no such thing as creating in a vacuum really like there will be someone else out there that has a concept similar to yours um and so you kind of have to put up with that you kind of have to it's like no no one's telling my story the way i am so i'm just going to keep going forward with it yeah so it's frequently anybody who believes that there is uh such thing as an original idea, I point them to the Stiff Thompson Index of Folklore Motifs. Right? Which yes. has every single concept with a number. <laughs> yes, and how many times have we seen the hero's journey? You know? like yeah, how but times... Remember what the hero's journey actually is. Uh -huh. And why... Okay, I want a bumper sticker that says slow down, you're not going to get to the egg first. That's what the hero's journey is. Getting to the egg first. Well, remember, it's for guys. Women go out and meet death. Oh. Titanic. See, you once said, and I believe this to be true, that you could argue mythology with Joseph Campbell. And I agree with no, that. No, what happened, okay, seven years old, before Joseph Campbell wrote anything, I'm sitting there reading books in the library and all the rest of this stuff. And I started to just relate them to what they were actually about. I said, that was fun. And then I didn't write anything. About it. <laughs> what did you say about having a good idea and somebody else runs with it? You're right. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, the hero's journey is basically the sperm. And Fair. It's, well, it's what it is. Yep. And some guys never get past it. We've all met sperm. We all have those guys. It is the truth. Um, but the, the way to get around the, the trope, here's the other writing hint. Your friends should be afraid of you. Whatever comes out of their mouths, whatever they do, rewrite it into your characters because you can't come up with anything as batty as the things that actually happen. This is true. This is true. The difference between example, fiction and reality, yeah. Just for an example, there is only one place in the entire known universe they have been able to detect a certain thing, and it's on this planet, and that is fire. Interesting. Huh. You can't come up with weirder than that. No, no. The, but the look difference... to reality. Look to reality uh, for your originality. Oh, 100%. It's 100%. just, it's everywhere. It's corny. It's stupid. It's funny. It's dangerous. What is it they said? If uh, you, you don't let God write scripts because he writes the most off the wall cornball scripts. Yes. All of this stuff. Yes. Anyway, but I'm just saying that the whole thing about people worried about tropes or what's original, just write literature. Literature is writing what you know, what you have seen happen. Yeah. And yeah. like you say, with your book about, you know, a guy in his pajamas, we can all relate. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, my final comic today um, uh, is one that hasn't come out yet. Um, it's called Agents of Paw. Paw stands for Protect and Watch. And it's sort of Buddy Cops meets Fairyland meets Peter Pan. The idea is that these two characters here, uh, rough is the wolf and toughy is the lion rough and toughy they protect children from dark fairies they themselves work for a fairy police agency um, who assigns them missions to protect kids 
Um, and of course, in the first issue, they they do the maverick cop trope, and they get busted back down to the IF department or Invisible Friends department, <laughs> and they think their career is over, nothing's going to happen, and then everything goes to hell. And that's uh, that's what's going on in the first issue. But I wanted to tell a fairy story. I wanted to tell something childlike and delightful, but with a bit of an edge to it without going too crazy. Um, so, of course, that's why they look so heroic with their guns and their blasting. And uh, their guns are taken away by page five. So, <laughs> <laughs> And always remember that the girls want to be with the dark fairies. Oh, 100%. Um, and in fact, uh, I've seen interpretations of uh, the Seely Court and the Unseely Court, where um, Oberon is the Unseely Court and Titania is the Seely Court, you know, the light and whatnot. But uh, there's that dark, should I even use the word sexuality? There's a dark um, energy that is very attractive about the dark fae, right? And it's, I. It's I, a natural I, thing in the world, you know? Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. Hey, and, look, everybody's turning everything into pets. Hades has become a hero. Loki gives, you know, gets um, Mother's Day cards from his kid. Yes. You know, this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Hercules, instead of going down and grabbing Cerberus, goes in and asks his uncle if he can take the dog for a walk. Yes. The cutification. Um... Well, it's not cutification. It's the realification. It's how do people actually relate to each other? Hades is Hercules' uncle, and that's the family dog. Fair enough. Fair enough. I they're like that cute. interpretation. To yeah. us, they're terrifying. To them, they're normal. Yeah. So it's viewpoint. No, I I'm think sorry. That's I'm great. doing a writing class here. I should listen. No, to and I love it. I love it. Uh, speaking as a writer, I'm like, uh, keep talking. Um, and I'm hoping that other people uh, identify with that as well. Um, so I noticed that we're we're at 7:30 here or 6:30 your time. Um, so I'll just put up this where to find two gargs um, thing. I think everybody, if you're if, if, trying to keep up with social media, is maddening. So what I recommend to everyone is get a link tree. It's one link that you could post that is all your stuff. So all your social media, whatever you're on, uh, Twitter, Blue Sky, uh, Instagram, blah, 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 you know. Um, and then, of course, have your own website. 100% you should have your own website. And I have just gotten into Substack because I'm a writer and it allows me to blog thoughts, concepts, ideas. So but, I recommend... Okay, Michael, yes. Just bring everything you've got to the drink and draw next Thursday, and we can have even more. I love it. I love it. Hundred percent. I'm in. I'm in for that. Because that's kind of like an extenuation of the talks, and even and more people show up, and we get more good stuff. Oh, um, I like it. But we, if you've got this and you've got the link to where to find this, uh, and you've got your Facebook page, then. Um, Thank you for the wonderful taste of everything you're doing. I had no idea what you were going. I don't think any of us did knew what you were up to. And uh, it's really just your crazy, you know, special effects stuff that, that caught my eye. And uh, <laughs> I think this is a very, you know, entertaining. And uh, I really appreciate knowing about the artist, which he's in the Philippines. That yes. One artist to work? yes. Yeah, Manila. Um, yeah. And again, and um, Bill will appreciate something we went through in that Michael says that he's always communicated with his artists through google translate uh yeah sometimes i've had to do that um i think and i don't have any proof of this i think yeah. some of them their english is through yeah, google Bell translate to me as well um he's yeah. just, you know he's on his back so okay so <laughs> but uh yeah but google translate has been invaluable in getting concepts across sometimes there's a cultural barrier like if you say hardware store like it might not look like what you think a hardware store is but the the basic ideas do get across but god bless google translate i will say that well thank you for a wonderful presentation beautiful art uh, letting us know where to find all your work and uh, just generally being entertaining and clear and um, as usual extremely pleasant oh thank you thank you very much for having me you guys and i will see you this coming thursday yep is your drink and draw 
That's correct. Beautiful. And that's at 6.30, 6.30. This is 5.30, 6.30 for the drink and draw. And uh, Bill will be sending out links. Love making it. sure everybody gets them. And um, you you can draw or drink or just talk and just have fun. Yay. 